Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, this is Benyami. Um, I'm going out live, I think, I hope, from Ascent in Swat. And wishing that I'd plugged in my headphone. So if you just hold on 30 seconds, this is our weekly Thursday night Ascent for bringing a sort, where I'm going to hopefully talk to you a little bit about uh, Jewish ideas as we do at Ascent in Svart and uh, welcome you to comment if you'd like to be part of it. Let me just see if I can find where this thing plugs in. If I can, I'll use it and if I can't, well, do it. Uh, yes, um, anybody who wants to be my technical advisor would like to help me with how to do this sort of stuff, uh, it would be really helpful. Um, Many of you know me from our uh, our lessons at Ascent uh, once or twice a week for over the last few years. And many of you, of course, have been into a home, into the Alexander home for Friday night dinner and some even for Shabbos day dinner, uh, lunch. And uh, so anyhow, I want to make you welcome. This event should happen with a little bit of luck and uh, God's blessing. Uh, every Thursday night at around 8.30 uh, Israeli time. And I'm um, sorry, I must apologize to those uh, who had become regulars up to last week. Uh, we did a couple of weeks in a row, and then last week I was actually on a plane flying from Israel to England, and I totally forgot that I'd promised to, uh, to give a, a short talk. So please forgive me for that. I'm hoping that this will actually, if I set up the settings correctly, come out at about 8.30 um, uh, Thursday night. Well, I am recording it the night before because, again, we're going to be flying uh, tomorrow night, which will be Thursday. So welcome to uh, the weekly Fabrengen from Tzfat. I want to tell you, I think I've got a nice story to tell and a, and a really important question to ask. And uh, those who have been in my lessons will, will know that uh, we're going to go off in several different tangents, but we'll come back at the end and hopefully may even get an answer to the, to the questions. I hope you find it interesting. So. Just before we get started, I have a very dry throat, so you'll just forgive me for a second. I'm sorry, I don't have any vodka here tonight, but I do have a little white wine, and I'm going to wish us all l'chaim, l'chaim. Uh, this uh, this ringing is, is given in the memory, particularly of my friend, uh, a distant relative called Patrick. Um, Patrick, uh, you're, you're, you're dearly missed. And may your memory always be a blessing for all the, all the people who knew you. And the other thing, the important thing I want to say is, there's a young man called Natan Shai, who is living in Sfat, who is extremely unwell tonight. Uh, we think he has pneumonia. He's a boy with a, a number of different issues. Uh, we bless Natan Shai with a refuel shalema, with a complete and absolute immediate recovery. Natan Shai, and uh, in memory of Patrick. So, l'chaim, everybody. Alright, so we have a big, big question that gets asked often, uh, particularly at our Shabbos table. And that question is about Shabbat. Now, I'm not going to talk every week about Shabbat, but it seems that we have done that for a couple of weeks, and it's just something that I thought of in the last few minutes, I really think it might be worth uh, thinking about. If you have comments, please make them. Um, the question is like this. We have, gosh, 613 laws uh, in the Jewish world, the Jewish people, and seven major laws for non-Jewish people. And some rabbis will tell you that all Jewish laws are equal, one to the other. Yeah? That uh, the kashrut, keeping kosher, is no more important than honouring your parents, and honouring your parents may be no more important than keeping Shabbat. And yet there are many people who say that Shabbat is the major mitzvah of all. Yeah? And how do we know this? And that is that we judge ourselves and our practice of Judaism not by whether we honour our parents, although that's one of the issues, not by whether we eat kosher, that's another issue, but the main way that we if you like, judge ourselves, because we don't judge other people. The main way we judge ourselves is, is reflected in how we observe Shabbat. And, and 
the rabbis have made it clear that this is a way that you tell, you know, that the Jew tells himself, ah, I'm not practicing Jew. Yeah. So in order to speak about that, uh, it, it keeps coming up because it's just so darn important. I want to reflect tonight on a particular issue. But first of all, I want to tell you about a friend of mine called Moshe, not his real name, because I don't want to say his real name because it'll, it may cause him some embarrassment. And one thing that we certainly don't do uh, in, in the Jewish world, if we're practicing, trying to do everything right, one thing we don't do is embarrass people, and certainly not in public. So I want to tell you a little brief story about somebody called Moshe, and we'll come back to Shabbat in a minute because it's all part of the story. It was a Friday, Friday lunchtime, I think, or early afternoon a few years ago, here in Tzfat, and everybody will know that Tzfat is up high on, on, uh, on a mountain above a beautiful valley looking over towards Meron. So our friend Moshe decides he's a single man, he's, uh, he's brave, he just uh, loves physical activity, and he decides to go windsurfing on a Friday after lunch in the valley over the, over the center. So while he's windsurfing, he's having a great time, and the winds are very vigorous over that valley, <clears throat> suddenly something goes wrong with his, his kite, and it starts folding up, and what happens? He crashes to the ground. And of course, he was, he was already flying along at a fairly, fairly brisk speed. And when he crashes to the ground, he goes bouncing along the surface, uh, dragged along by the kite, which is still full of uh, a certain amount of wind. He, uh, he rolls over and he thinks, oh my goodness, am I injured? And he had cuts up and down his arm and a very large gash, if I remember correctly, in his thigh. Yeah, very large gash. So he gets on the phone and he calls either some friends or an ambulance and they, they come and they take him to Ziv Hospital. They clean up the wound and then they decide, you know what, that wound in your leg, uh, in your thigh, it's actually a piece of stick that had been caught as you were being dragged along and it poked through, through his uh, trousers and into his leg and it's still sitting in his leg. And they said he's going to have to have surgery to take it out. Right? It's a bit more serious than just a scratch. Uh, from before. Okay, we'll come back to, to Moshe. Let me write down that I said his name is Moshe so that I don't miss it up and use his real name. M-O-S-H-E in English. Okay. I want to ask a question tonight. We'll come back to Moshe. I want to ask a question tonight. Really, what's so important about Shabbat? Oh, do you see my glasses are crooked? Maybe I slept on them or something. What's so important about Shabbat? And a measure of what something that's very important is what happens if I don't do that something, yeah? Uh, if my parents teach me as a little child not to run across the road without looking, well, what's the potential consequence if I do run across the road without looking? Surely the worst uh, case scenario could be hit by a car, heaven forbid. Um, and and, and uh, some other issues, you know, uh, don't put your elbows on the table is what we were taught as, uh, as the children of Englishmen. Uh, what's the consequence? Well, the consequence is your parents are going to be angry. You're not sitting neat, uh, nicely and eating uh, in a proper way at the table. So, so the consequence of one action could be uh, more devastating than the consequence of another action, not so devastating. So in measuring, in looking at the subject of Shabbat, one has to say, what's the consequence? Once I'm committed to Jewish practice, yeah? And I'm not telling anybody to keep any mitzvot particularly or what they should do. I'm just talking about what the law says, if you like. Once you accept Jewish practice as being your way of life, then what happens once you start to keep Shabbat is it becomes, if you look at Shabbat, it's a multitude of different things. Shabbat is, uh, it comes from, uh, as we said uh, uh, two weeks ago, it comes from the Torah, where we're told that God created the world in six days, and on the seventh day he rested. So what do the Jewish people do? We rest, right? It says, so remember the Sabbath day and guard the Sabbath day and keep it holy, yeah? And it tells us to rest. What is rest? Ah, rest for us is not necessarily lying down and sleeping, although hopefully we do a bit of that, at least uh, in these long Shabbos uh, in summer, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere. But what is rest? Rest is separating ourselves from the secular workaday week. Yeah, so that 
uh, we can think and, and, and aim our activities towards more spiritual um, activities, because that word again, uh, and put aside the, the physical uh, or the non-spiritual aspects of our physical activity. Yeah? And so we dedicate 24, 25 hours to uplifting ourselves, uplifting our spiritual status in the world, <clears throat> so that we're indeed obeying God, and that is bringing Kodesh, holiness, to, a special level of holiness to the days of the day of, of Shabbat, the night and the day of Shabbat. So that's what we do, and it, uh, there's a lot of laws, a lot of things to remember when you're keeping Shabbat. But of course, once you've been doing it for a little while, it becomes natural. It's, um, so, so what do we do? We light Shabbos candles at our, our women and our daughters light Shabbos candles and we sing Kiddush, we bless the wine before we eat, we say Amotzi at the table, we cover the, we have two chalot, two, two uh, special twisted bread loaves uh, on our table and we eat a feast, yeah, and that feast involves eating and uh, within reason drinking, yeah. And this is how, these are some of the things that we do on Shabbat. There are some more, uh, more um, intricate details of, of the laws, but these things we do, and we, we leave the television off, we leave the computer off, we don't turn lights on and off. Uh, so sometimes on Friday night, if you don't have a special time and your lights are going all night, as they are in our place uh, on Friday nights at the moment, because we can't work out how to, how to use the timer. And uh, we, we, push ourselves a little bit away from doing too much physicality and certainly from any sort of creative activity. So we don't write, you know, we don't use the telephone and so on. All right, so why am I bringing up all these things I wanted to talk about? We don't talk much about punishment. I don't like talking about punishment. I don't like talking about negative stuff. But what are the consequences if a person intentionally, a person who is already keeping Shabbat, a person who doesn't know about it or hasn't decided yet, <clears throat> they're, if you like, in a little bit of a different category. But what about the person who has decided, I'm sorry about the camera moving so much, very lively camera. Uh, what about the person who has decided to keep Shabbat and has started practicing Shabbat? Yeah, doing all these things, a lot to remember. What happens if it's coming up to Shabbat? When does Shabbat start? Um, Starts for my wife when she lights the Shabbos candles. Starts for me when we get to about Lachad Odi in the, in the Friday night service. Um, or it starts uh, around sunset, uh, as a general rule. So when the sun sets on Friday night, and I see that the sun has gone down, my wife has lit her Shabbos candles, and all of a sudden I remember I've got a, a wonderful sister in Australia. I forgot to ring her to wish a good Shabbos. What's the consequence if I intentionally, being a Shabbos observant person, if I intentionally pick up the telephone, oh, it's not a telephone, it's a glass of wine, so the What's the consequence for me, for Binyamin, if I intentionally say, oh, I forgot to ring my sister, and I pick up the phone and I think, oh, well, Shabbos is in, but I'm just going to do it anyhow because she'll worry about me or, or maybe she'll miss our Shabbos greeting. <clears throat> What's the consequence if I, if I do that? What's the consequence if we live in a town where there is no special arrangement? And the special arrangement is called an erov, like a fence around the town, uh, which exists in most Jewish uh, cities, but not in all. Uh, of course, in Sfat, we have two erovim, two erovs, two fences, one going around the other. And I, I guess that's a double protection. If one breaks, we still have something called an eruv. An eruv is a protected area within which you can carry stuff on Shabbat if it's something to do with Shabbat, right? So uh, if I want to, for instance, carry my prayer book to the synagogue, to shul, then that's allowed by most uh, rabbis if you have an eruv in the town. We have an eruv, a fence around the town. So what happens if I'm living in a city, uh, let's say in Bendigo in, in Australia or some small town where there's no air of? Then what's the rule for Shabbat? I'm not allowed to carry anything, even if I think I need it, right? So, so the consequence of that is, what if I've got a bit of a cold? 
and I, as I said, I'm intentionally keeping Shabbat. There's no Eruv, and I say, ah, to heck with Shabbat, I might get a drippy nose, I better carry a hanky with me or a tissue. Okay. These might seem like really minor issues. I rang my sister or I, or I carried the tissue on Shabbat. What's the consequence of this? The available consequence doesn't mean it's going to happen, but the available consequence or punishment, if you like, at its worst, is that I can be punished by being separated from God. Yeah, it's called, it's called Tourette, uh, that I can be separated from God or even killed. Yeah, as a, it doesn't happen, but the punishment that is available to somebody who, who's, who's doing this, carrying out a forbidden activity on Shabbat, if they know it, if they know about it and started keeping it, then all of a sudden it's, ah, what the heck, I'm going to carry a, anything. You know, I'm going to carry a football to, to the synagogue when I go to pray tonight. And it's already Shabbat. Punishment is karet or being killed. Shudder to even say it. Now, of course, there are very powerful uh, rules relating to this that actually prevent this punishment mostly from happening. Firstly, the person has to have the knowledge that it's Shabbat. Secondly, they have to know that ringing the sister, uh, ringing anybody on Shabbat is an avera, uh, which is the, the opposite of a mitzvah. Thirdly, he has to be warned against, somebody has to have come up to him and said, I mean, you know, you're not allowed to ring, ring your sister on Shabbat. You want to keep Shabbos, don't ring, don't ring your sister. And, and there have to be two witnesses that saw you or heard you ringing her and then they warned you and then, and then you did it again intentionally. Ah, under those sort of circumstances, the, the punishments are available. It's said, however, that a Sanhedrin, which was the court in the, in the early days of the Jewish uh, nation, the court that ruled that a Sanhedrin that gave capital punishment to more than one person in 70 years was too strict. So even though the laws are there and the punishment there is available, it's very rare that such a thing would be carried out. The main thing that we would do if I rang my sister and suddenly realized, then suddenly realized a broken shop as I didn't mean to, is really to make tshuva, yeah, to promise God you won't do it again and perhaps to uh, uh, put it very deeply inside your mind and your heart and your soul that you'll be very careful about not doing this avera, this opposite of a mitzvah again. But, so the question arises, why would the punishment be so severe for picking up a telephone? Got one here somewhere, a telephone. It's not such a bad thing. Or for carrying intentionally on Shabbat. Why would the punishment be so severe? Now we have to switch again. We talked a little bit about Moshe. We'll come back to him. Now we have to switch gears a bit. For those who've had the, the joy to be in Sfat, especially to come to a sentence in Sfat, I'm pretty sure that you would have also taken the time during your trip to Israel to visit the Kotel near the Western Wall. What's the Western Wall? It's a wall that ran outside the ancient temples that stood in Jerusalem. When I say temples, that's because there were two, not at once, but there was one and it existed for, for many, many years. The great temple that God instructed us to build when we came into the land of Israel. And then, unfortunately, that was destroyed by enemies from Europe. And then we built a second temple. And unfortunately, after some years, that was also destroyed. So, so what's so special about Jerusalem? What's special about Jerusalem? A, a number of things. One is that the temples existed there. The temples stood there. And please God, the time will come when the third temple will be built and stand in that place. The other thing is, of course, that as we said last week, the prayer... Actually, we understand prayer rises up to heaven from Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is very important. Yeah, it's a very important place in the heart of every Jew. Now, my guess is that Jerusalem, since we came into the Holy Land, and that wasn't in 1948, I'm talking about originally, uh, if you want to count the years, the Jewish year, according to the Jewish calendar today, is this funny number. I'm going to write it here. I don't know if you'll be able to see it easily on the screen. But the Jewish year as it stands today, this is counting the years from creation, is the year, oh, it's backwards, I think, 5778. Now, what happened is we came into the land of Israel. Originally, the Jewish people 
following Moses, although he didn't actually enter the land, after we'd escaped from Egypt, we came into the land, let me think, in the year 2488. So if you look at that, that's about 3,300, almost 3,300 years ago, we came into Israel in the year 2488. And what happened? God told us when you go into the land, you're going to build this temple. Yeah, you can build the place that'll be the central place where you should worship me. And what happened once the temples were built is that three times a year as a minimum, every Jew came from wherever they were in the Middle East, wherever they were in Israel, in the land of Israel or other places close by. And they, they came three times a year at the time of the pilgrimage festivals to visit Jerusalem and to sacrifice, to make sacrifices in the merit of the good that God did for them or the merit of what God will do for them, us, and also in the merit of certain requests. So you had a sick relative, heaven forbid. You would come and pray for that person to recover and at the same time give a sacrifice on the on what we now call the Temple Mount. Yeah. Um, so this was the major activity that the Jewish people did throughout the year as part of their worship to come visit the temple, give sacrifices, and the temple was completely open, not just to the Jewish people, but to the world. But it was, of course, the central worshiping place for the Jewish people. We would come here three times a year to Jerusalem, to Jerusalem, we call it by its Hebrew name, and we'll give, uh, we'll give thanks, and we'll give praise, and we'd make requests, and then we'll return to our homes, and, and God would look after us, yeah. Even though we we're already in those days, of course, we had the Torah law. So in addition to coming to the temple, we we're keeping Shabbat and we we're eating only kosher food and all the various other things that we do as Jews, uh, circumcising our sons at the age of eight days. Um, all of these things we we're doing, but the essential mitzvah in those days where we said the essential mitzvah of today is Shabbat. And again, I, I must explain, I'm using my own, uh, my own understanding of this. Or, or rabbis who would uh, who would see it a little bit differently. Um, the major activity in those days was our connection to the temple in Jerusalem, and this is what it gives Jerusalem its a great level of kedusha of holiness, and and it was the major sign that we were Jews. Yeah, that we we're active Jews. We come three times a year and give uh, thanks to God. All right. So what happens today? We don't have the temple. We don't have the temple today. And what has really become openly the major mitzvah of a Jew is to, to keep Shabbat, yeah, to keep the rules of Shabbat. So what was it like when we came to the temple in those ancient days? The building for a start had large windows which opened to the outside, big stone walls, of course, and, and those who've seen the picture of the Kotel will get an idea of the sort of stone that it was built out of. And the windows were narrow on the inside, right, because the walls were extremely thick, but they, they opened out like that, yeah? They were wide on the outside, why? Because the temple exuded such a level of holiness and light that in order to spread that out to the rest of the world, the, the windows got wider at the, at the end and reflected a, a much larger uh, degree of light into the world. They say also that no bride, that the temple was so beautiful, that it had its own aroma, its aroma from itself, just what it was, and also from the spices that were used during the sacrifices. Uh, it had this most beautiful smell, which we can't replicate today, and it said it, it smelled so beautiful that no bride in temple times that no bride in Jerusalem even wore perfume, right? Today you get all printed up and, and you make uh, uh, nice with perfume and uh, beautiful clothing. No bride wore perfume in the days of the temple because the temple itself was so beautiful just to breathe it in, yeah? And the truth is I've got, I have a personal feeling when I go to Jerusalem, to Jerusalem, and I stand at the Kotel, I love to breathe in, to smell the walls, yeah, <laughs> although this isn't the actual external wall, it's outside the walls of the temple, but I just love to feel what there was. Okay, so the temple was beautiful. It was physically, uh, had a beautiful aroma, and people came there and worshipped here. It was the height of, height of what we do. 
today, without the temple, what's the height of what we do? What's the most important thing we do? We keep Shabbat. Yeah, and the rabbis have said, it's well known, the philosophers have said, that uh, while the Jews keep Shabbat, Shabbat will, will keep, keep the Jews. Yeah, this is the thing that keeps us together. It's the thing that helps us to recognize each other as, as Jews. Yeah. And it's the thing that, uh, that gives us a great deal of chizuk, a great deal of strength. Yeah. And my, my thesis is that Shabbat, at least for the moment, has taken the place of the temple as being the central theme and the central thought and the central thing that a Jew does. I'm not saying that when the temple, please God, will be rebuilt, that there won't be Shabbat. Of course there will. But I'm saying just today when we have no temple, certainly Shabbat is the greatest thing that we can do. Okay. What happens to Moshe, right? The guy flying his kite before Shabbat. He's taken off to the uh, Ziv Hospital, the hospital here in Sfat. And the doctors look at him. And as I said, they see that there's a, a stick poking into his leg and it's actually under the skin. They can't get to it. They can't take it out without surgery, right? What happens when the surgeon comes along and they anesthetize him and clean everything up and he goes to cut this boy's thigh, yet to take out the stick? I'm guessing, I'm not a medical person, although I visit the doctor occasionally, but I'm not a medical person, but I'm guessing that if the doctor cuts exactly where he needs to cut and takes the stick out and does it in a very clean way, yeah, that, that he's successful in his work, yeah, he, he does what he needs to do. What happens if he accidentally he slips or he blinks or he gets a tear in his eye and by mistake he accidentally cuts an eighteenth of an inch to the side or an eighth of an inch to the side or you would say in metric a millimetre or two to the side and doesn't cut where he has to cut? It's probably not going to kill the patient, right? It's probably it's going to say whoops and they'll clean up that, uh, that injury and go and cut where he has to cut. Okay, there's a man... Uh, cutting the muscle of a leg. I don't mean, mean to talk about gross things. He's cutting somebody's leg. He cut a little bit out of the, out of place. What happens? Okay, he'll have a little bit of a wound there. It'll clear up and it'll all be forgotten. So let's think about what happens if somebody is not having a repair made to their leg, but if somebody's getting new valves put in their heart or a replacement heart, yeah? If somebody's having open heart surgery. And I don't want to say bad stuff, but just think, what would happen if, heaven forbid, the surgeon, for some reason or another, I've never heard of it happening, but what would happen if the surgeon accidentally is cutting, in, heaven forbid, into somebody's chest and cuts a little bit off to the side? Potentially, the, 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 uh, the operation could be a disaster, yeah? Heaven forbid, you should cut the heart in the wrong place or the valves or whatever it is medically. So there's a big difference between doing surgery on the heart and doing surgery perhaps on the leg or the foot or the toe or the arm or whatever. My thesis is like this, the Shabbos is the heart of Judaism. Yeah. Time was back uh, 3,000 years ago and it hasn't stopped, but the temple was the heart of Judaism. It was absolutely the central theme of Judaism was all around the temple and the celebrations of the temple and the singing, the dancing and the sacrificing and more singing and dancing in the temple. Chaim Chaim, the temple should be returned to us soon. Please God in Jerusalem. What happened if when we had to leave the temple behind when it was destroyed? What happened when the heart of Judaism was gone? If only temporarily, what happened to the heart of Judaism? So my understanding is that Shabbat became the heart of Judaism, right? And as we said, well, the Jews keep Shabbat, Shabbat will keep the Jews. Uh, I should tell you that the city that I live in, Sfat, is all about Shabbat. And the, the rabbis have said that, uh, what they say when, that uh, a, a regular weekday in Shabbat is like, sorry, a regular weekday in Sfat, resembles spiritually resembles a shabbat anywhere else in the world a weekday right has that spiritual uplift 
uh, in Sparta. Anyhow, so, so what's the point? The point is we had a heart. We had the heart of Judaism. That's the place that the Jews came to three times a year minimum to relate to God, to thank God, to request of God, and also to be together with the Jewish people. Yeah. What happens in Sfat now every Friday night and in Yerushalayim and in Tel Aviv and in, in uh, Hebron and in every city where there are Jews around the world, Jews come together yeah, to sing and to dance and to praise. I have to thank God. Thank God we had another beautiful week. And to thank God for the week that's coming and, and, and to look forward to the week that's going to come as a result, as a result of our behavior on Shabbat, how we uplift the Shabbat and how we turn Shabbat into a very spiritual activity, uh, how that's going to affect the next week's level of spirituality. So when I think we talked about this uh, about 10 days ago, that you know, we, we're, we're living at a certain level of spirituality yeah, and we're going round and round in circles. I know you probably can't see it so well on, on, on the camera. We're going round and round in circles, coming back all the same to the same spot. But then in comes the Shabbat and it lifts us so that that circle, that returning aspect is not a circle anymore, but a spiral that we're growing in our Judaism, growing in our spirituality. So Shabbat is today, I think, the heart of Judaism, as was the temple some centuries ago and as it soon will be, please God. So the original question was why are the, the potential punishments so severe for breaking Shabbat? It's like the surgeon taking a knife and cutting to, not cutting into the leg, but missing, missing the point, yeah, cutting the heart. So we take extraordinary caution once we know about Shabbat. And once we make a decision that we want to be a practicing Jew, we take on this very, very deep, meaningful activity and it's not just not turning the lights on and just lighting the candles and just drinking kiddush wine it's a, it's a whole ball that rolls together and gets bigger and bigger and bigger and, and very important in our, in our lives right i believe that shabbat and if anybody wants to argue or disagree with me or, or give comments on this i'd be happy to hear them i really believe shabbat is today at this moment the heart of judaism we look forward to the return of the temple we look forward to be able to go and worship in our ancient ways in, in Yerushalayim. Uh, but until that time and beyond that time, Shabbat, maybe alongside the temple, will continue to be the heart. So let's, those of us who want to be in the environment where we're practicing Judaism, let's encourage ourselves to, to strengthen the heart of Judaism, not to put it in danger. And I think by avoiding those little averot, those little opposites of, of mitzvot, I think that we're doing the job of keeping Shabbat and, uh, and looking after the heart of Judaism as it is today. I am so sorry that I've come to the end of what I wanted to say. I'm just enjoying this so much. I hope that you'll join me. And I'll just remind you that I'm Benjamin, Benjamin, living in Sfat. Yeah, many of you have met me. And if not yet, please God, we'll meet soon. Um, and this presentation is, is given in, in the merit of those people who came to Ascent in Svat and to any Jewish person around the world, but particularly to the, the members of the I Love You Ascent uh, site. I think it's a, a f Facebook site. You should be blessed that we all uh, get together once a week for this uh, about 8.30 on a Thursday night. I'll try to be more accurate with my timing in future. And then we celebrate whatever it is to be Jewish. And then we ask those questions that we need to ask and we answer uh, with the answers that need to be given. Now, I should tell you, if, uh, if I'm giving this little mini Fabrengen uh, any time and you want to interrupt either with a question or a comment about what I'm saying or even not about what I'm saying, but, uh, please, please do interrupt. I'm more than happy to take questions and, and to try to give answers. And if I don't know the answer, I'll ask a proper rabbi who does. God bless you all. Uh, Shabbat Shalom. It should be uh, that we really look forward to every Shabbat and uh, that this Shabbat should be the greatest Shabbos of all, the Shabbat uh, that brings, encourages the Jewish people to come home. So someday soon we'll all uh, be here together. Um, which is the greatest thing for, for us to, to be together as Jewish people. 
and to love each other and to celebrate uh, our, our simchas together and also occasionally to mourn our tragedies or to, uh, uh, to, to, to comfort each other when we need to. As I said at the beginning, this uh, little talk has been dedicated to two people. Uh, one, Patrick, we mentioned before, who passed away two years ago on this day, a uh, close uh, relative of people I'm close to. And the other one is to uh, Natan Shai, uh, who's uh, in hospital at the moment with pneumonia, a young, little, lovely little boy from Svart. I hope that you'll all pray that he returns to full health. His full name is Natan Shai Ben Khana. And we should only know good news. Shabbat shalom, lots of love from Svat.